the uh, humorous part of it is that I'm used to the cold. I'm from Alaska. <laughs> Only my blood got thinner. Sometimes I think uh, that some days, especially when you're under spiritual attack or something, or you're going through a lot of challenges because of ministry things, that uh, my thin my skin gets thinner too. <laughs> but seriously, one of the great joys I have is knowing who I know and not what I know. I mean, there were lots of times that, oh, I, I knew when someone was wrong, but I didn't know what was right. You know, I, I could hear what they're saying and I just, you know, didn't buy it. I always thought, oh, that's wrong. Oh, yeah, that's wrong. Oh, that's wrong. That's wrong. And most of my Christian life, I, even though I was studying and learning and God was teaching me, and believe me, if God teaches you, you will learn it. <laughs> Because it'll come out in you. You'll see it in you first. And he'll make it there. <laughs> Believe me, you don't know you have it in you until it comes out from inside you. But I didn't know what to do about a lot of the things that I saw that were so wrong. Or how God could make it so right. And I began to understand that Christians, most of the time, have good intentions. Sometimes they got good ideas, but a lot of what they've been taught about this faith that they have has been more about kind of get get something, get an idea in your head and run with it, you know, and then put all your lock, stock, and barrel in it. And, you know, hopefully if it works out, then that was God's will. If it doesn't work out, it wasn't God's will. Only I was smart enough to figure out just because something works out, was that God's will? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's one thing to say when you're a baby Christian, well, Lord, can open this door, you know, if it's your will, then God, will you open this door and I'll step through it. Or, God, I'm going through this door, if it's not your will, stop me. And you can try that a few times, you know. <laughs> I just want to be there and watch. <laughs> But the truth is, God gave us his word so that you would know his will. <laughs> Shucks, I want to watch you go out there and try to, oh, let's do the circumstances thing. Let's do the circumstance dance. Let's do the circumstance. And try to make it fit into what we want to do by making God distant so that he's not real and alive and living in you to tell you what to do. Let's ignore Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that says, oh, he would direct us if we would trust in him with all our heart and lean not in our own understanding. You see, there is in the nature of man this rebellion that goes against the grain of who we are in our flesh, but what we're supposed to become in our spirit, which is to submit ourselves. Now, right now in America, Christians have a big problem. They don't know how to submit. They don't want to submit to the President of the United States of America, that's for sure. <laughs> they don't want to submit themselves to local authority because sometimes it's corrupted, that's for sure. They want to protest and contest and fight and get into court systems and do all those things and rise up for our rights and get into politics and get into this and get into hmm and getting into the mess do you think that's the rest that Jesus meant when he said come unto me all ye that are heavy laden and I will give you rest do you think that God is only about giving you some kind of like little key to carry around in your pocket so that whenever you want to use it, you can solve your individual problem and then just go off on your own tangent and do your own thing and act your own way and be your own self? Do you think that God intended you to be like, you know, now another popular quote unquote football player is serving God by serving the football? Okay, maybe he's serving God, and he just happens to be a football player. Wouldn't it be nice if at the 
apex of his career, when he looks like he's the greatest, he would walk away to serve the greatest of all? Because you see, that's what a lot of Christian missionaries have done, and a lot of Christian men of God that are remembered throughout eternity. Football players aren't remembered, not for very long, no matter what they tell you in the Football Hall of Fame. And frankly, God remembers the Christian Hall of Fame forever and eternity. So if you're looking for fame and fortune, I don't know. I think I'd be wanting to do God's will, not my will. Funny thing about doing God's will, though, it is His will and not your own. Submerge our wills in the will of God. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Matthew 26, 39. Where there is no freedom of choice, there can be neither sin nor righteousness. You can't miss the mark if you don't get to choose to point the arrow. Because it is of the nature of both that they both be voluntary. Righteousness is a choice that you make. You may not realize this, but love is a choice you make. However good an act may be, it is not good if it is imposed from without. The act of imposition destroys the moral content of the act and renders it null and void. In other words, if you're made to do something, you no longer have a moral will to do it. You are being forced to do it. Sin is the voluntary commission of an act known contrary to the will of God. In other words, you know, you know what God wants you to do and you didn't do it. That's sin. That is voluntary commission of sin. Where there is no moral knowledge or where there is no voluntary choice, the act is not sinful. It cannot be. For sin is the transgression of the law, and the transgression must be voluntary. So for in order there to be sin, there must be knowledge of the law, and the law must be inside of a man that he knows that he's going contrary to the law that he was given. C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, proved that in the law of nature, the law of gravity, the law of creation, and in all that he could see in the natural world, he could prove that God existed, and that law existed, and so did mercy, grace, sin, and love, as well as the Trinity. And he did it. It was a fascinating read. It's really good. I recommend it sometimes you ever read it. It's deep, but it proves, logically, that there is a God. Lucifer became Satan when he made his fatal choice. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Clearly, here is a choice made against life. Both knowledge and will were present in the end. He knew what he was doing. He had made his choice. Conversely, Christ revealed his holiness when he cried in his agony, Not my will, but thine be done. Here was a deliberate choice made with the full knowledge of what the consequences would be. Here, two wills were in temporary conflict. The lower will of the man who was God, and the higher will of the God who was man and the higher will prevailed. Here also was seen in the glaring contrast the enormous difference between Christ and Satan, and that difference divides saint from sinner and heaven from hell. The secret of saintliness is not the destruction of the will, but the submergence of it in the will of God. You have the freedom of choice. You can choose whatever you want to do, and the consequences of that choice will be your own. But the only thing that's going to make you saved and of salvation is when you do the will of God as he is determined for you to accomplish for his purpose and his design. Because as much as we say that salvation is accomplished by what Jesus has done, if you don't know him and he doesn't know you, then at some point in time he says, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And how would salvation be applied? to the person who never knew Jesus, and yet claimed to do it. For lots of things that we don't understand, we trust in our God to realize it for us, to make it applicable to us, to make it such a way that we can live by it and have an assurance of it. Jesus died that we 
should not perish, but have everlasting life. It didn't mean that we automatically are given salvation with no confrontation of our will at all. But rather, Jesus chose to give us an example of which we were to follow him by what he said to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. By doing those things he told us to do. Love does cover a multitude of sins, but in order to receive the forgiveness and the mercy and the grace, someone has to give that out to you and impute it to you by way of somebody doing it for you. And Jesus accomplished the reason why God would. But has God done it for you? If you really want to know if you're saved, by way of once saved, always saved, whose will are you living by today? Is it your will to be done? Or is it his will? Self-will versus God's will. That's where your battle line is. And in everything you do, and in everything you say, and in every thought you have, that's where the battle line will always be. Thy will or my will be done.